Thank you, Rebecca. That's awesome. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, Rebecca's just given me a greater overview of the projects that all of you are working on, so I'm really excited to show you what I'm involved with and maybe give you some tips and tools for moving forward. So um, I'll be talking about some web design fundamentals, and these are all really closely interrelated, and you can't really have one without the other. Each one of these aspects will help you to create a more robust, accessible, excellent site. So first we'll talk about content strategy and design principles, and then we'll talk about usability and accessibility. And please feel free to stop me at any time. You can raise your hand and ask me a question, because really, we're all here to learn together, and if you have a question and you're missing something, then you know it's good to answer those. So first of all, you'll want to start with great content. Uh, make sure that that content is then easy to use, easy to discover, and it's accessible to all types of users. Um, because no matter how beautiful your site looks, if the content isn't great, then it's not a usable site. So when you're reading online, we read in a non-linear fashion. Our brains are conditioned to skip around. It's more visual, so when we're reading a book, we have more attention time. Um, we spend, we're able to focus on something for a longer amount of time versus online. And we actually use different parts of the brain. There's a really cool lecture by Dr. Stanislas Dehaney. Excuse me if I pronounced that wrong. It's called Reading in the Brain. And she gives you visual represent representations. So the old model of learning, we would gather visual input and then process that input and then translate that to meaning. Now, when we're reading online, our brains are bouncing all over the place. They're connecting to different centers, our visual center, our language center, and, and then processing that information. Because there's so much going on in the brain, we have a shortened attention span and reduced comprehension. Excuse me. So this is something to really keep in mind when you're writing your content, because if someone only has 10, 15 seconds on, their, on your page, you want to make sure that they gather the most important information first. And then if they want to delve deeper into that information, then they're able to see where they need to start next. So when users come to a website, they have an online objective. They either want to find information, answer a question, or perform a task. Dave Copeland says in Best Practices for Writing for Online Readers, and this was such a great quote that I just put the whole thing here. He says, your writing offline or online is effective when readers take away your message. Writing effectively online doesn't mean that every reader reads every single word that you write. It means that they can quickly and efficiently get the information that is most important to them and move on. Um, and I know that I, I'm pretty sure that everyone in this room are excellent writers and have a lot of great information to share and content. And I've seen that struggle and I've seen it in myself too. We have so much information to share and we want to write it so beautifully well as if we were writing for a publication and when someone's coming to a website they want to find something a lot faster so it's, it's a tough balance of presenting all that wonderful information but presenting it in a way that's visual that's accessible and the way that they'll actually be able to understand the content So on the note of concise content, you want to make sure that you get to the point, edit out unnecessary information, use easy to understand language, and avoid marketees slash promotional writing jargon and acronyms. So a note on this. Um, when a user sees a web page that says, um, I'll just use an example, I'll, I'll use my own so I'm not picking on anybody else. The University of Utah Marriott Library is the best biggest, most expansive, wonderful library in the world with the best librarians <laughs> and the greatest services, which that might be true, they are amazing, um, but when someone reads that, they dismiss everything that's fact. 
They just see it as an opinion, it's marketees. Um, people relate that to ads and not to actual awesome content. Um, jargon are, is language that's specific to a certain group. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And a note on acronyms, we may find that we have these acronyms that are part of our everyday language that we say multiple times a day, but for some people, they don't actually know what that means. Um, so in our own web pages, we've gone and spelled out those acronyms, even if it's something that seems so intuitive for us. For example, we have the Automated Retrieval Center, which we typically refer to as the ARC, but to another user that might um, conjure images of animals and pears, and not actually a center where millions of books are stored. Um, so I'd like to ask you guys, do you have any acronyms that you use every day that you think that are really intuitive, that maybe somebody else might know, not know? OPAC. OPAC, yeah. It's a good example. I, I, I've heard that acronym so many times, and I couldn't spell it out for you, though. Yeah, yes, so I can spell it, but not uh, <laughs> define it. Yeah. That's a really good example. Any others? ILL. ILL, yes, that one. That's one that we use a lot and in our library loan. So even a student who might be familiar with ILL, maybe you have an international student or a high school senior coming across this webpage and they have no idea what it is. Ill? I don't want to go to this university, I'm going to get sick. Oh, you are. Yes, that's a really good one. <laughs> awesome. So, on an OER webpage, Open Education Resources. Awesome. But um, so you might want to spell that out and then put parentheses around it. So, Open Education Resources, OER, and then if it's on the page a dozen times, maybe then you don't spell it out every time. But you want to remember that when readers come to your webpage, they're scanning, they're picking out bits and pieces, so you want to make sure that if they only see this one paragraph on your page, that they're able to gain some important information from that. Yeah. I always like ULA and ALA with their round table designations. Wow. I never know what any of those are, and I always have to go search because they're never easily defined. Yeah. I heard someone say lava. Is that the one that you think? Lava? Lava? Lava. Oh, yes. Who's putting llamas in lava? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm in. Yeah. I did see the, the llama acronym on a poster that my colleague created, and it was the llama president, and I still don't know what llama means. But if I knew that there were a llama president, then I would have told him to run, because it's amazing. <laughs> So writing online, like I said, it's visual. You want to utilize white space and keep paragraphs short. And you'll find that people actually spend more time on information that's surrounded by white space because it's easy to see, it doesn't hurt the eyes, they're not bombarded by lots and lots of words. And this was really cool. So online readers actually fixate longer on bulleted lists actually spend three times more time, attention time, when there's a bulleted list. So this, this was done with eye tracking technology, not in our lab, but in another lab. And they found that, um, so the red is when they're spending more time looking at the page, so they start to scan, and then once they get to a bulleted list, and they start to spend a little bit more time on your page. And that's not to say to go and put bolded lists with everything on your web pages when it doesn't make logical sense. You always want to go back to that rule of thumb of having good content, logical content. And then this is a eye tracking uh, eye heat map. So people are actually spending three times more attention time on the bolded list. So this is really cool when our department came across this information, and um, we had a real-life example where we opened up a family reading room and had all these awesome resources there, but we kept getting 
Well, their department kept getting calls asking what was in the family reading room, even though all the information was already on the web page. And we direct them to the web page, but they're like, no, no, but, but what's actually in the family reading room? So then um, we removed a couple promotional words, and then we put the information in bolded lists, and people were actually able to find the content. So it was really cool. So you might have all these amazing resources, all these great tools, but if it's not right there, then it's hard for people to find. So you can also break up your long content using a variety of tools. Um, sometimes you have content that can't be broken down. So our library policies, all of them need to be there. It's very important that all of them are viewable, they're accessible to the public. Um, it's not something that we can shorten without rewriting the policies. So you can do this with headers, you can do this with tabs. With this page, we employed a few different solutions. So we put tabs, breaking up the content with patrons, service principals, labs, computers, food and drinks, so that the patron or the person enforcing the policy can go directly to the right policy. We also broke up the content with headers and accordions. So if you were to click on <laughs> um, if you were to click on the plus sign or on the header of the accordion, then it would open and show you more information. So you've probably seen this on lots of web pages. Um, a few design principles to keep in mind. You want to make sure that it's cohesive and consistent. So now we're moving on from content strategy and moving more towards design principles. Uh, do you have any questions before we before we move on? Yes. So I understand that web pages you shouldn't have a lot of text on them, but I think the trend lately is that there's hardly any text anymore. It's all images, images, and you scroll all the way down, down, down. And I thought traditionally they said you shouldn't have to scroll down, but to get to any content, you have to go miles down it seems, and then they have something to buy. I agree. Yes. This is the, the other problem. Um, you want to make sure the images that you have add value. And then there's a principle in newspaper design. Before I did web development, I was a, a journalist. And they said to make sure that your important content is above the fold. So when someone lands on your page, what's the most important content? And have it right up there. And sometimes that's an image, but most often that's some text and maybe an image explaining that text. So moving away from having lots and lots of decorative images and having images that add value, add content. But the trend seems to be content is hidden. Yes, I, yeah, I agree with you. And I think that that's, that's a problem. Um, but you guys can make your own web pages also. And then people will go to yours. Yes? I was just listening to some of my colleagues yesterday talking about this. And I learned from them while I was working that uh, the reason for that trend is because there are more devices, more handheld devices than actual desktop computers anymore. So, so most web pages are now designed with the tiny screen in mind. Mm -hmm. And when there's a tiny screen, people are more, uh, they have a greater expectation that they're going to have to scroll. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind that a lot, of, a lot of these things that are designed the way she was just describing are because there's a lot of other trends. Exactly, and that's a good point. So the mobile user definitely expects to scroll, but you want to make sure that they're not scrolling through a bunch of superfluous content before they actually get to the meat of the content. Um, there was a slide that I had in here that I took out. It was the inverse pyramid design for content where you want to have the most important information first, and then secondary information, and then the least important at the bottom, which hopefully isn't even on your page. But um, because they find that for all users that actually go to your page, a large majority of them um, leave immediately, which is called bounce rate. And then only, and I'll have to get the exact percentages on this, and it depends on each web page as well, even fewer will read your first paragraph. And then by the time you get to the last paragraph, hardly anybody's there unless they're heavily invested in your content. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, no, it was a discussion, sorry. It was a, it was a statement of which I know little about. 
Yeah, okay. Awesome. I have those too. Um, so, so yeah, just, just coming back to having your most important information there first and engaging readers so that they want to read more. Whenever I think about web design, my mind, and my group knows this, my mind immediately goes to Google. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's just a fantastic example of being successful mm -hmm. with almost nothing but white space. Mm -hmm. So I want to see things be like Google as much as possible. Um, on the other hand, Google is selling something that is extremely simple to understand. You just type something here and you get something. Whereas uh, with us trying to sell OER, we feel like we need to teach something on the home page mm -hmm. first. Um, I still think that there's, there's a good way to balance that. Um, I guess the idea of the upside down pyramid scares me a little bit. That you're putting an enormous amount of information right on your right on your home page. So I actually meant um, rather than an enormous amount of information, the most important information, the okay. crucial part. So maybe think about it like the first thing that comes to mind is a podium at the Olympics. You want everyone to know the first place winner, and then the second, and then the third, and then maybe. So we'll, we'll jump to the second bullet and then come back. So you want to make sure that your images add value and that they're accessible with alternative text and alt tags. And I'll delve more in detail about accessibility in a little bit. But you want to make sure your images are 72 DPI. That's the standard resolution for images on the web. Print materials are generally around 300 to 600 DPI. And that just makes them load faster. You also want to make sure that they're sized to the size that they'll be on the page. So that they're maybe 500 or 700 pixels rather than 20,000 pixels. And that's in inches, that's maybe oh, three or four inches versus 40 or something really, really big. Because if your image is really, really small, but then it's trying to render, I'm oh, sorry, it's really, really large, but it's trying to render really small, then your image size, if your image file size is over a megabyte, then you need to resize it and you need to make it smaller. Um, that'll make not only your web page load slower, but any web pages that are associated with it on the website. So it's really important that you have small images, but not too small. Big enough for the page, but not bigger than that. Does that make sense? Cool. And then back to design, you want to make sure that it's cohesive and consistent. Cohesiveness and consistency translates to professional. So you want to make sure that the font, the colors, the layout are consistent. And not only will this make your website look more professional, but if you always have your contact information, for example, in the upper right corner, then someone on your site knows to go there for the upper right corner. And I really wish that it would be consistent for um, businesses and hours, or restaurants and menus. If I had like a personal crusade, that's what it would be, hours and menus. So this, this relates to what we were just talking about. So you want to design with mobile in mind. This is a really good example that I found. So your site doesn't sit on a desk anymore. You have tablets, phones, um, Kindles. So this would be your standard site, and then this would be tablet, and then here is the mobile version. And I'll give you some tips to easily implement this on your site. So I'll give you a few examples of responsive design. Oh, excuse me, I need to connect to the internet.
think I'm, sounds like, like it's you. You think I'm sitting in a room with sound on? <laughs> well, <laughs> sounds like it's coming directly from you. Come on. Awesome. Wait till we can find out what else we think about you. <laughs> it's, it's good. <laughs> where you have to... Yeah. This example, and not just because it had teal on it, but mostly because it had teal. Um, so here's the desktop version, and this is built using responsive design, um, and I will show you what that means. So here we have the standard desktop laptop size. When I move this, and I'll scroll down a little bit to show you. When I get to tablet size, these boxes, portfolio, portfolio, journal, which were all in one line, get moved down to underneath each other. And the system that, or the language that we use on the Merit Library website is called Twitter Bootstrap. And I would venture to guess that this one does too, since um, it's built on the 12 grid system. So portfolio, portfolio, journal, respect, contact, those each take up three out of the 12. And luck is probability taken personally, takes 12. But then when you get to a point where there's just too much information to fit in the 12 sections, then the columns that were over here on the second half get moved underneath. And then when you get down to phone size, then everything gets shrunk down. And portfolio, journal, respect, and contact get moved up here. So. And you don't need to know a lot about coding or really much about coding to do this. Um, I've built, you can, if you're using a WordPress template, they have a whole section of free responsive design templates. They're pretty good. Or you can just tell whoever's coding your website, say, hey, I want to make sure that this has responsive design. There's another way to go, and that would be to have a mobile version of your site. But if you've ever, been looking for some information and you only have your phone but you can't find that information on the mobile site so then you have to go to the full site and then scroll rather than having two copies of your website one with less information that would be your mobile version you can just go and have responsive design and then have all of your information there but have it rendered in the best way possible for whichever device your user is on and then this is another good one just because it had desserts on it <laughs> Is it designed well though? Or just because there's desserts? It is designed well. So what I like is that it has information here um, and that it's accessible on your mobile device. If I had to pick between the two of these, I'd probably pick this one. Um, just because rather than having portfolio, journal, and respect stay as boxes, they go, since they are navigation items, they then go to the top. Um, and I'll show you the Marriott Library website just because they know more about it. So we've also used Twitter Bootstrap. We have a lot of information to present, so it's a little bit trickier to fit everything. But when you get down to tablet size, which would be right here, see how you have the drop downs? 
Um, when you get to mobile devices, drop downs don't work very well. So then this menu gets converted. Yep. I was told that's Moaning Myrtle, which made me really happy because I'm a Harry Potter geek. And then everything gets moved down. Um, you also see that these icons, they're font based. It's called Font Awesome and Fantastic Library, which I think is really cool. So these icons are infinitely scalable so that if you are on a large retina screen, they won't be pixelated. Or if you're on a mobile device, then they'll be scaled down proportionally. Yeah, or um, the Font Awesome library. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing to use for icons. They've added a whole lot more. So we use the icons in our quick links. We also use them in our contact information. So the phone, live chat icon, email, in person. There's so many of them. In fact, we, we have a couple minutes we could look that up. Um, they also have a really beautiful website, and all of their icons, they have web application icons, currency, so many, they even have Bitcoin. <laughs> so, lots of options there. And they're really easy to plug in, you just copy the, the code for it, and then insert it. And the code's really short here. It's great. So this is my cue to pause. Do you have any questions about design principles or responsive design, why it's important? Yeah. So are, are we just really getting away from, in general, having mobile sites? Is, is it just, is it going to die? It would be my personal preference that it die. <laughs> um, I've found some examples where it makes sense, but it's a stretch. Um, so there was also some a statistic that I came across in preparing for this that 91% of all mobile users have their mobile devices within reach 24 seven. Um, and that if, we're, if we design with mobile in mind, then we're better able to access those users. So now I'll talk about usability. Um, so when you're doing usability testing, you test your website or your web page, gather data, you synthesize that data. So maybe you test 10 individual users or you lead five focus groups. Then you take that data that you've synthesized, put it in context, and um, if you are someone who needs to go to another Let's say you're going to administrators or another group that's approving your design or your choices with your website, then that would give you some context in which to make changes. And then it's an ever evolving cycle. You just keep testing, and the web doesn't sleep, so it's good to test and stay on top of it. Um, I really like this quote from Web, Credi web Credible. They're a lender user experience agency. And user experience involves usability, accessibility, um, best practices, and design. They said usability testing offers a rare opportunity to receive feedback from the very people the website is aimed at before it's too late to do anything about it. But I'd like to add an addendum to this. Um, there's always time to, to do something about it unless you make a really horrible mistake, which is why having someone proofread your pages is very important. Um, there, we actually do em employ the process of reviewing web pages, and that's my job, one of my jobs. Um, and one time I came across a page that had an innocent enough typo, but the meaning of that typo was just awful. It was really terrible, and so I was really glad that I found it. First I took a screenshot, and then I changed it <laughs> and republished. And now you're going to share it with us. Okay, well I won't tell you the details of what it was. It was really bad, so I'm really glad that I found it. Um, the person had meant to say it will be a black tie affair. And they had put it will be a black tie affair. And I was like, oh, we have to change that right now. This is really bad. 
So it might be something the spell check doesn't get, so make sure that you have someone read over your web pages. And probably don't publicize that too much. So usability can take a few different forms. You can do individual testing. Um, it, it's shown that you'll start to see repeat results after about 10 tests. Um, you can conduct online surveys, which is a really quick and easy way to gather feedback. You can ask lots of different people what they feel about your site, what they'd like to see, what they're struggling with, and you can access lots of users that you wouldn't normally be able to reach if you were to just have a test um, in person. We can also conduct focus groups we found have been really, really useful. So individual testing has helped us to gather answers on specific questions. Focus groups allow us to see a greater picture and what people would really like to see. So I run the usability lab at the Marriott Library and some of the usability testing that we've done, we've brought in undergraduate and graduate students, we've worked with faculty, with the faculty and staff within and outside of the library. And you want to make sure that your participants, of course, are representative of your user group. So when you run focus groups, you can find out how your users utilize the site, ask them about what works well, what does it. And this was a tidbit of info that I gathered from someone else at a conference, that you'll find people who come to your user groups, they're either people who really, really love your site and want to spend time helping you to make it better, and you'll also find people who really, really don't like your site. Um, fortunately, we haven't seen these extremes super well represented in our focus groups, but you might find that that's the case. So when you're designing a usability test, you want to make sure that you're designing tasks that are essential to the site success. And that could be finding today's hours, searching the catalog if you're a library website. What would be some of the essential tasks that you would want your site to have, if someone were to have success on your site, what would that mean to you? Well, we don't have like a catalog in Word and stuff, so Good search engine on your site is crucial. It's so important. Yes. I like to make sure you can get back to where you were easily and not get lost in a loop or mm -hmm. somewhere else. In there. So having navigation that's right up front. Yeah. It's really easy to see. That's really important. Really crucial. Yes. Get the my library account. Yeah. A lot of libraries, it's not on the first page. Sometimes you have to first go to the catalog and then you can go to your account. Yeah, or, or read information about your account and how to use it when you've already used it and you just want to log in. Yeah. There was one, I know when I try to pay rent, I have to click on four different links from their homepage in order to pay. I'm like, I know you want my money, why don't you just put this right up front? That'd be great. Um, any others? So, and, and also designing scenarios rather than find X can be really helpful. So imagine that you are a, an architecture undergraduate student and you're trying to find classes that you need to graduate. Where would you go? Who would you contact? What would be some other scenarios that you could develop for your websites when you're testing them? Exactly, yeah. So imagine that you need to... Um, Exactly, yeah, having 
So what we've done on our web pages is when we have, for example, rare books. <laughs> Whoever's the head of rare books and then someone who would also take questions for that, their contact information would be there. So that the contact information is in context with the page. Yeah, that's really awesome. You're doing a book. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that would definitely be crucial to your site success. Yeah, and having that information right there. And then see, the cool thing about usability testing is that you get to see how someone finds information. So we did have one usability test uh, a little while ago where um, we had, I think about seven tasks, five to seven is usually pretty good. And for every single question, the user was going to Google for everything, even though we'd had them open up the library homepage and we expected people to navigate within that web page, but they were going to Google for everything. So it's really important that um, and this touches a little bit on metadata and search engine optimization. But you want to make sure that the metadata for your page, the properties, is very up to date and well organized. So, and then Google's actually changed their algorithm, which is something that they do often, which is kind of frustrating, but good. They're trying, really, what they're trying to do is match the pages that someone's trying to find, or when someone's searching for a page, they want to guide them to the best page, just like we all want to provide a really good service. So now they've moved away from keywords being the most important, and now it's the description. Because they want to make sure that when you, and I'll show you an example of that, when you search for a page, the page title, the description, and then the information on the page all match. So when you search for Just a second. So when I search for the Marriott Library, I see a description underneath the page. And this one to two sentence description is actually something that we've put in our own properties. So if you don't put anything there, then nothing will show up. Or if you have enter description here, then that will show up, which is even worse. So that one sentence, the J. Will and Marriott Library provides research tools and et cetera. Yeah. Yep, they're the most visited, and they also look at your navigation. And then they take that into account, so you'll see that most of these are in the top navigation. Research tools, collections about the library. Um, but yeah, it is looking for information that is regularly updated. So a page that's published frequently with, with good updates will come up higher in Google because they see that it's an active page and not an archived page. Myrtle, it sends me an update every month, and then I tell people that. I'm just kidding. Um, so Google sometimes releases updates and more information, but a lot of the times it's at a conference, I hear about it, or it's through a training. Um, really just involves some research and, and keeping up to date. A lot of the times it's, oh, did you hear that now Google's changed that, their algorithm? which is kind of frustrating. But if you do your research, then that'll be fine. And really, as long as you're, you're making good web pages with good content that's accessible, that's updated often, then you'll be fine. Cool. So here's a little cartoon. When you're building a usability solution, it could be something as simple and as free as sitting next to someone while they navigate through your web page. Um, and it says, if you can't read it, it says, so what would you do next? The facilitator asks, and the user says, I think I click here, 
and the facilitator is watching over them saying, more, 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 pot. But there are some tools that we've used that I'll share with you. Um, our Marriott Library Usability Lab, it's a low cost usability lab. We have three computers, two PCs, and a Mac. We have the Marais software, which has a discount for um, higher education, and, or for edu has an education discount, excuse me, and then Silverback, which is a really low cost solution for the Mac. I just looked it up again, and it used to be free, and now it's free for 15 days, or a 40 or $80, to purchase it. Right now they're having um, a promotion. But I'm not here to sell either one of those. I just want to give you some insight to what we've done. Um, we started our usability Garrett lab through an innovation grant by Debbie Rockshaw, which used to be my supervisor, now she's over at University IT, and Tracy Medley, my, my current supervisor. Um, that was in 2009. They purchased the Murray software two Logitech cameras and microphone sets, two PC computers, and a Mac computer. Um, so Silverback is the software that's, that we use on the Mac that's really well used. It's a clear left product. It captures screen activity, and it records the participants' reactions in voice. They've actually developed it to be a little bit more robust. So here are some of their new features. Um, they let you log user tasks. Select sessions highlights. You can control the app using your phone, which is really cool, which I haven't tested out yet, but I'm excited to. They have a new interface, an advanced export, which is really cool because before their file sizes were so large, so large that they would take 30 minutes to export a file that was a test that was maybe 15 minutes long. It was really terrible. But they've, they've updated some of that. Um, Marais is the software that we use for the PC. It's a little bit more involved. There are three different parts of it. There's Recorder, which allows you to test it. Observer, which allows you to watch it. And Manager allows you to analyze the information that you've received. So it's great for analyzing in depth. You can, there's tons of online tutorials, but unfortunately it's only available on the PC. So we also have microphones in our lab that if, we, if you'd like, you could have a user talk through what they're doing, which is something that you could do just having someone sit next to you and navigate through the pages. Um, here's a picture of Murray Manager and what it looks like. So I have all the tests in the upper left, and then I'm able to go through each one and create graphs based on time on task. So if I find that people really, really struggled with task number three, then that might be something that we'd want to revisit. We've also added eye tracking, which allows you to see where your user are looking. So those heat maps that I showed you previously, those can be generated with eye tracking technology. And then you can utilize that research to guide page and template design. We use Mirametrics S2, and that's because it was the best option for higher education, meaning the best value. Um, it was a tenth of the price from the next option. It's unobtrusive and um, really cool. So it's just this little device that sits underneath the computer. It's about that long and that high. And um, you calibrate it looking at different parts of the screen, and then it's, it's really easy to use. There's some other options where you have to wear glasses and headsets, and so it's a lot easier to use. So that's my cue. Do you have any questions about usability testing, starting up a solution for your web pages? Um, and it really could be just as simple as having someone who's not involved with creating those web pages look at your pages before you. So uh, last, I'll talk a little bit about accessibility. There were a lot of examples of these. It was kind of sad. So I think we can all see what's the issue with this attempt at accessibility. So there's a wheelchair ramp, and there's a bunch of stairs. This isn't a skate park? 
<laughs> maybe it no, is. No, it's not. There are there. Um, that would make a lot more sense. So I just shared some of my, um, just a few of these. Um, the, this one on the left is really concerning because it doesn't even start out accessible. Like, there's no way. Or, or maybe it's a really scary descent. Um, yeah. And then the one on the right, another example of well intentions, but maybe they're just not finished. I don't know. So a few things to keep in mind. Someone might have vision impairments um, or color blindness. They may have a mobility issue, so using a mouse is difficult. Um, and you want to make sure that it's accessible on across browsers, operating systems, and devices. And um, this one's just really scary. <laughs> I've seen, I've, I wish I would have taken a picture. I saw an example of this um, in Croatia once, and I was like, that looks really, really scary. It was almost a complete vertical upright. It was maybe, you know, a few degrees. So you want to make sure that your site is practical for all user types, and that'll just make your site good. It's not this thing that you tag on afterwards. It's something that will make your overall site really awesome. You want to avoid redundancy and increase efficiency. And this is, this is important because if someone's coming to your web page and they're using a screen reader and they're so there's things that you can do to make something more accessible. You can add headers and you can add tags to links so that if someone's scrolling through their page, visually you can scroll, but if they're using a screen reader, then they have to tag through, tab, uh, tab through each option. So if there's a lot of redundancy on your page, then that person's having to listen to all these things said in a myriad of ways. Um, at a presentation that I saw recently, someone said accessibility is empathy. It's understanding someone else's point of view. Um, and a really good tool is to go and use a screen reader to look at your web pages. On the Apple products, it's built in. So on your phone, you have accessibility options built in, and that's one way for it to be somewhat free. Um, there's also JAWS, which is a typical screen re reader, and some other tools as well. So, there's a few different guidelines for web accessibility. Um, at a baseline, you want to make sure that it's Section 508 compliant. For a, a good level, for if you're looking at best practices, optimal, you want to look at WCAG 2.0 level AA. And WebAIM, which stands for Accessibility in Mind, has a good um, example of that. So. So WebAIM has all these different examples for how to, re how to reach level one, how to reach, which is level A, and then level double A. Um, universities are required to be accessible, and there actually are some universities that have been sued for not being accessible. And a really sad case was where the Office of Disability, their web pages were not accessible. Um, I can't remember exactly which university it was, but it's really important to keep in mind if you are um, a state site, then you need to make sure that it's accessible. Um, and just across the board, if your site's accessible, then you'll be reaching a greater audience. And an accessible site it is inherently a really good site. back to this one real quick. So, um, excuse me, it's showing me a different views. So I'm a little, okay, all right, we'll go back. I was a little turned around. So there's some cool things that you can employ. We're actually just talking about this before. I was talking about this with Rebecca. There's a no coffee add-on in Chrome, which lets you check the color contrast for um, color blindness, and there's also a really easy way to just grab a screenshot and uh, bring it into Photoshop. And there's also a WebAIM color contrast checker. So I'll show you the Photoshop option, which is really cool. All you have to take is a screenshot, which is really easy to do on a Mac, or you can print screen in 
on a PC. And then if you go to view, proof setup, color blindness, then you'll see two different options. So we've taken our homepage and put it in there. And we've also checked the uh, contrast, which will give you a score. And then the higher the score, the, the more contrast it has, which means that it's easier to see. So you can view and check the contrast. And it's, it's pretty interesting to see. So the accessibility guidelines are based on these four main goals. You want to make sure that your web pages are perceivable. It's available to the senses, whether someone's viewing it or they're, <coughs> excuse me, hearing it through a screen reader, or they're, um, you know, navigating through it through touch. You want to make sure that it's operable, that the forms, the controls, and the navigation are operable. A note on audio and video. So if you bring your videos into YouTube, not only can they all be on one channel within your organization, but YouTube has built-in accessibility controls. So the play, the pause, those will all be built in. Um, to be really accessible, you would want to make sure that you have a transcript of a video or audio. YouTube will do their best attempt to put the, the captions on but sometimes they're a little funny and not quite accurate. And you want to make sure that, of course, it's understandable, and that goes back to making sure that your content, your interface, they're understandable. And robust means that they can be accessed through a variety of ways, including assistive technologies. Do you guys have any questions about accessibility guidelines? Yeah. Do you have any specific recommendations for making a tablet more accessible for a user? Yeah, so I would definitely first start with having a responsive design because then that will make sure that your drop down, if you have drop down menus, that they're converted to radio buttons. Um, because it's really frustrating. Well, I think some tablets do okay with the drop downs, but phones don't. And it's really frustrating to be on a site that doesn't have any other options besides the drop downs and you can't even navigate to a page otherwise. Um, you would also want to make sure, of course, that your most important content content is at the, the top. And um, following these general guidelines that WebAIM puts out would help you be accessible not only on the tablet, but on other devices as well. You want to make sure that your images have alt tags, they have alternative text. So what is the information that someone who is a non-sighted user, what's the information that they would need to have so that they're not missing some crucial information. Um, also having, I mean, there, there's so many different things. You want to make sure that your links are in context and descriptive. So we definitely want to move away from any links that say click here. Because if someone, because using a screen reader you can just tab through all the links. If they see all these links that just say click here, click here, click here, then someone wouldn't be able to find which link they actually want to find. Um, and that also makes your content scannable. So if, so if someone's scanning your web page and they just see click here, then it doesn't give them an idea. If, if I want to find hours or contact information, then I'm able to find hours and click on that rather than find our hours here. And there's just a link. Um, yeah, there's so many things, and it's and it's cool because I, I really like this presentation because they're they're so interrelated. That if your site has good content that's concise and scannable, and is tagged properly, then that'll make it accessible. Um, do you have any specific things that you're concerned about? With? I was actually thinking how to format a physical tablet to be most accessible for someone who is visually impaired. Oh. Or
really cool. Yeah, t uh, the, the keyboard, definitely, and then the controls. Are you able to manipulate the controls on the tablet? We believe we will be, but we're not totally sure. We haven't purchased the iPhones yet. Yeah, um, I know that Apple products have built-in accessibility. I'm not sure about Androids, but I, I would hope. Um, and I imagine there are some out there as well. Yeah, that's really neat. I'd love to talk more about that. That sounds really cool. Yeah. So in summary, I'm going to make sure you start with concise content, which I feel like I've really drilled that one in. Um, design with mobile in mind, since so many people are coming with a mobile device. Conduct some usability testing, which could be as simple as someone just using your site and you watch them. And you want to make sure that it's accessible. And here's my contact information, amanda.crittenden at utah.edu, and I'm with the University of Utah Marriott Library. So I think we have a couple more minutes if you guys have any more questions or anything you want to discuss. We have 15 minutes to lunch, so we can yeah. take a quick break in five minutes. Sounds great. And if any of you have questions as far as being a team, call Amanda over to your team if you don't want to ask questions with everyone listening. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'll be here through lunch, so. Thank you.